Awesome. Thank you. Go with me for a second to rural Sweden, where two towns exist, one called Hied and one called Beartown. And in this town, in both these towns, uh, hockey is life. If you've ever watched um, Ted Lasso, football is life. Here, it's hockey is life. Hockey is everything to this town. Old men at the bar sit and talk about their glory days, and they converse about the new kids coming up through the program. There's parents that shuttle their kids straight from school to the ice rink. And everybody in this town cares about one thing more, more than anything else, and that's hockey. Coaches live by the opinion of the public, whether they win the game or lose the game the night before. If you're catching the picture, hockey is everything to them, but not in a purest sense, not in people that just love the game, not like just people who are like, man, hockey is just such a great sport. But you can find in this town that so many people, for so many different reasons, have their identity wrapped up in their local hockey team. And I want to talk about two important figures in this story. Uh, we're going to talk about the story of Beartown hockey. And there's two important figures I want to talk about. First is Kevin Anderson. Kevin Anderson grew up in Beartown. He's played hockey for a long time, and he is the head coach of this team. And on that team exists a player uh, who is the star player. Parents are telling their kids, hey, be like Kevin. Kevin is the one who's always starting. Kevin's always the one who scores the most goals. It is always Kevin that is the star of the team. But Kevin messes up big time. Kevin does something that has massive implications on the life of another person. And Kevin does something that could land him in prison. It would mean that he would for sure be off the team and not be able to play. However, the situation is a he said, she said situation. And if you've ever been in a he said, she said situation, you know that people take sides, don't they? I believe this person or I believe that person. And this town is divided as to whether you're on Team Kevin or you're not on Team Kevin. There's those who believe Kevin's side of the story that believe Kevin can do no wrong. There's no way he would have done that. There's those that say if we can't accuse him of this because then he can't play on the team anymore and we need him to play so that way we can win. Kevin's father goes as far as to accuse the head coach, Peter, of lying and trying to get him fired. But then there's those that believe what Kevin did. They stand by the victim in the story. They believe that Peter isn't lying. And they believe him so much so, they believe that Kevin messed up so bad that when the team loses the finals because Peter benches him and they aren't able to play in the final game, they stand by their decision and think it was right to lose by not having Kevin play. In this story, a vote is held as to whether Peter should keep his job or not as head coach. And after some people in the, in the village are all torn up and people are saying terrible things about each other and they're divided, you're, I'm on this team, you're on that team, all this different stuff, a vote is held and Peter keeps his job. Because Peter, if you read the story, it's Bear Town by Friedrich Bachmann. And if you read the story, you'll know that what Kevin did, he actually did. And so Peter was in the right here. But here's what happens after that. Kevin's family doesn't like that. Kevin's family decides to move out of Beartown and move to Hied to play for Hied Hockey. And with Kevin's family go sponsors, goes other team players, go a lot of favoritism that went towards Beartown Hockey, but now has left because a division happened that has now split this hockey team that everybody loved so much. I look at that story uh, by, Friedrich Brock, by Friedrich Bachman, and I think if we replaced pieces of that story, not even much of that story, but just a few details about the names and the places and what happened, it would sound a lot like our story with church. It would sound like a lot of our stories with relationships, where it started with a division, and people took sides, and people fought, and people disagreed, so much so that it came to a point where a rift became so large that people couldn't even be in the same town together. Anybody else experience anything like that? Anybody? All right. I think that it's so prevalent. I think we all understand division. I think we all have, have sensed and felt what it feels like, especially in the church. Because what happens is that we, what has happened is that unfortunately, Christians, we've got a greater legacy of division than we have unity. We as Christians are known for arguing 
for fighting, for offending, for hypocrisy. We voice strong opinions brashly. We withdraw to comfortable and safe places. We disengage from difficult issues. You ever had that happen? Where you're trying to talk about something with somebody hard, and they're like, well, that's just, that, there's a lot going on. I can't engage in that, and it hurts. And we refuse to reconcile with those around us. A quote from this book, Beartown, says this, culture is as much about what we encourage as what we actually permit. Soon, the head coach of Beartown Hockey A team says, most people don't do what we tell them to. They do what we let them get away with. Unfortunately, in the church, we've let people get away with division. We've been okay with it. We've said that, you know, they were just standing up for truth. Them shouting their opinions harshly on the internet, that's just them defending their faith. It was whack. In the name of guarding our morals, we've withheld love from somebody that was different than us because we're, we're holding on to this truth. But that's not guarding our morals. In the name of not being of this world, I'm sure many of, those of us who have been around the church for a while have heard we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. Yes, we are meant to be like Christ, and not like the brokenness we see around us. David Mathis, an author, writes, rather, we are to be not of this world, but we sure as heck were sent to it. We are in this world to love this world and to show them Jesus. This, this disunity I'm talking about, this division, this brokenness, I'm here to tell you today that it's not the way of Jesus. We're in this series called There Is More. Anybody been digging it so far? I have been. It's been great. If you guys are here, you're new, you're like, I don't know what's going on. Don't worry. We're in this series talking about that the cross offers more than maybe you've experienced. That maybe you've experienced hard things, tough things. Maybe you don't have much experience with church. But at the foot of the cross and who Jesus is, there is more to offer than maybe the hurt that you've experienced in the past. And so today we are talking about this idea that there is more unity, that the cross offers more unity. And uh, Elijah asked me to preach on this today, and he gave me Acts 2, which if you know what Acts 2 is, uh, it's Pentecost, so just really easy stuff today. It's just a, it's a really light topic, nothing intense. Pentecost is a crazy passage, and he knows, he knows I went to Moody. He knows I'm not that charismatic. Like, he just gave me the Holy Spirit showing up in people's lives. But all right, we're going to get into it today, and I'm excited. Um, what we're going to see in this passage is these early Christians, that uh, Jesus has just died and resurrected and all this crazy stuff has happened. But what we're going to see in this story is that God intervenes in a big way. God does something huge in a, in a crazy way. And we'll see the results of that and how that breeds unity, how that brings about unity with the people. And we'll see that there is more unity because our God is jealous for unity. I want to take a second just to introduce myself. For those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Brendan. Uh, I am not one of the pastors here. I just go here. And so I'm very thankful to get to be able to preach to you guys today. Thanks for being here. Um, we're going to get into this today, and I'm really excited. But before we get into the passage, would you guys just join me in prayer for a hot second? God, thank you so much for today. God, thanks for her baby dedications of the sweetest little face. God, thank you for bringing us here today. Lord, I believe that nobody in this room is here by accident today. God, I pray as we dive into your word that we would find healing, that we would find encouragement, that we would be challenged, that in all these things, Lord, we would see who you truly are and be able to cast off the things that are just man-made religion and live out what you actually have for us. We love you so much, Jesus. We praise your name. And everyone said... Amen. I work with students, so I'm going to be high energy today. If you guys are here and you're like falling asleep, wake up. It's go time. You guys ready? Let's go. All right. Part of that, I'm going to have you stand up because we're going to stand up and read God's word. So go ahead and stand to your feet. We're going to get it going. You with me? Together? All right. One person. Cool. Me and you, buddy. All right. Here we go. Uh, we are in Acts 2. Uh, we are going to be going through a lot of Acts 2 today, but uh, I'm not going to make you stand for the whole thing because... Our legs get tired. So uh, we're going to be in Acts 2, just reading the first uh, 12 verses here. I'm going to read this, and at the end, I'm going to say this is the word of the Lord. And if you'd like to respond, thanks be to God, you are welcome to. This is what it says in Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Crazy stuff happening. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. 
When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Ferga, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we heard them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? This is the word of the Lord. You guys can grab a seat. So we see this passage today, and we're going to see God entering to the, into the room and some amazing stuff happening. The first thing very clearly here, you don't even have to like have any kind of faith at all, but clearly you would see if you read this passage that something wild is happening. And what we're seeing here is that the Holy Spirit is entering the room and causing some unity. The, I'm, I went to Moody Bible Institute. I grew up kind of non-denominational. I like three points. If you're taking notes, we got three points today for you. So point number one is this, is that unity comes through an act of the Holy Spirit. Unity comes through an act of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you guys, but unity is not my go-to MO. I think for most of us, we would agree that as humans, we like to divide more than we like to come together. That we like to split up and pick teams and pick, t- pick sides more than... Uh, that's just not our natural inclination to be like, you know what, let's all be friends, kumbaya, drum circle on the beach, right? We like to divide up. But here's who our God is. Our God is unity. Our God is triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, existing in the Trinity. He is in unity with himself. It's literally who he is. For those of you guys who grew up Catholic, you might know the Athanasian Creed that says this, that we worship one God in Trinity, in the Trinity in unity, neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence, meaning that God in and of himself is in unity. That's just his nature. That's who he is. And therefore, if God is unity and he has created us in his image, that would mean that his desire for us as humans, every single person made in his image, that his desire for us as humans is to also live in unity. But unfortunately, we live in a broken world, don't we? We live in a world filled with sin, a world filled with brokenness. And so what Christ did is on the cross reconciled reconciled us to himself, offering us the chance to live in unity. Because here's what I know to be true, is that in our brokenness, God gives God. Here's what I mean by that. In a broken situation, in a hard situation, the best thing to heal it is God entering the room. And and I know that true of my life, and I know many in this room can say that for themselves, that the best thing possible is when God steps in, God gives God, and he gives himself to fix the brokenness And he gives himself here in this story to bring unity. Pentecost is this festival that would happen every year. So like trunk or treat, hay place, harvest festival, Halloween, whatever you want to call it, whatever your experience is, that's what's happening 2,000 years ago. And they are having this festival, but this is unlike any other festival because the Holy Spirit comes into the room. And I love that this passage, uh, if you notice, sometimes in scripture, I think we read the Bible and we're like, everything is exactly how I read it on there. And for the most part, it's true. But in this passage, we see it was like a great wind. Things like tongues of fire. It was so wild, they couldn't even describe it. They just had to pick something. Like, any, anyone go to the path of totality for the eclipse? Yeah, some of you guys did. Awesome, great. It, it's kind of hard to explain, right? People are like, how was it? And you're like, oh, it was really light. And then it was like really dark. And there's a giant donut in the sky. And like, it's like, it was like a circle, but then like not a circle. Like, have you ever seen it? You're cut your thumbnails. Like, I, it was just like kind of hard to describe because sometimes you see things and you're like, I would just, I don't, I don't exactly know how to describe it. Because back then, imagine the Holy Spirit coming to the room. We would all take our phones out and be like, this is going on TikTok. Like, check it out. Holy Spirit in the room, right? They didn't have that back then. So they're saying it's like this. I'm sure some of you grew up more Pentecostal can explain it better than me. But here's the result. We know this. We know this result. That it caused people to be able to communicate in a way that had never, been, that had never happened before. That it says that people were hearing the wonders of God spoken in their own language. God gave God to bring unity. They were in unison without divider of language. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. God bringing them together. 
I work for uh, an organization called Young Life. Anybody here heard of Young Life? Any fans? Sweet. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. Harrison's one of my volunteers. He's the best. Um, at, at Young Life, we take kids to camp. Anyone ever been to camp? Sweet. Awesome. Who can spell camp? Great. Everyone in the room, you're on my team now. Great. I got you all. Perfect. So we take kids to camp, and at the beginning of the week, sometimes you have kids that know each other really well, and sometimes you have kids who are like, I'm meeting this person for the first time. They're calling them by the wrong name. Like, oh, actually, it's Brandon, not Brandon. Oh, okay, got it. So um, they're trying to get to know each other. And one of the things we love to do at camp is make sure that we have these team unity things. We want to make sure that everyone feels connected and together. And like as a cabin, we are like a fighting force. Like we are together in this. And so one of the things that we did after years of taking kids to camp is we realized We take uh, middle schoolers, and we call it wildlife because they are wild. Uh, We realized middle schoolers love sneaking out. They just think it's like the greatest thing to ever happen. And I don't, there's not like a 7-Eleven down the road. They can't like sneak out and like do anything fun. It's just like open fields and locked doors. Like I don't know what they're sneaking out to, but in their mind, sneaking out is the greatest thing to have ever had. Like that's all they talked about. That's all they wanted. They were just like, I just want to sneak out so bad. And so we decided, you know what? Let's let them sneak out, but we'll do this very planned. So what we would do is we would go to the staff of the camp and say, hey, got these boys. They want to sneak out. Would you help us with a planned sneak out? Would you help us like sneak them out, even though like you, like they're breaking the rules, but we know that they're doing it. And they're like, yeah, we got you. And so they set up people like out on like the field and they're like, with a flashlight like this, like scanning it, like it's Shawshank Redemption across the yard or something. Like, I don't know. But they're like scanning, which like as a middle, like as an adult, you see somebody with a flashlight like this and you're like, what are they, a robot? But as a middle school, you're like, we got to get down. Like the light's coming over our head, like dive into the bushes. Like they would go all out. We would have like, we would take them the farthest way around camp to get there. And the whole goal was to get to the game room where there was ping pong and air hockey, like not things worth sneaking out for, but in their minds, that was the greatest thing of all time. And so like they are dressing up like in all black. They got like underwear on their face. Like it's a shiesty. Like it was just like, they would go so hard on this. They're like, we're sending them across fields, like two by two, like army ranger, like two, go, go, you go that way. Like it was so insane. And then we finally get to the game room and the kids are just like, this is insane. We made it. Like they're high-fiving. Like they just like beat the Viet Cong or something. Like it was like so nuts. And they get there and then we get busted. Somebody from the staff comes in, opens the door, goes, what are you guys doing here? And the kids, like, it was like they saw their life flash before their eyes and just, ah, just running back to the cabin at full speed. Like I'm talking middle school, even like the chubby kids, they were going fast. Like it was crazy getting all the way back to the cabin as fast as they can. And they get into their cabins. And my favorite thing about the sneak out every time was they would get into their cabins. I'd be like, get in your sleeping bags, lights out. And you share. Like, they're so out of breath, but I'm like, control your breathing. They're going to catch us. It was so insane. And I tell you this whole story because what was so great about it was that at the end of the week, these kids are bonded like they literally went through war together. They were like, we snuck out and we didn't get caught. And it was so incredible. And they have this unity that is just unmatched because they snuck out to play ping pong. Like, it was so great. And it wasn't just the sneak out. Like we were spending time, learning about God's word together. We were doing small groups. We were doing all this stuff. And I really believe that at these camps, God enabled an environment where middle schoolers and high schoolers that live in a really tough time to live, which is the modern era with social media and all this stuff, were able to experience God in a way that is really hard to do when you're back home. And I think God created this experience and it created unity out of them as they were war buddies from their sneak out. And it was just insane. And so as we look at this, these stories, how do we do this for our own lives? How do we live this out? How do we have this type of unity? My encouragement would be that I think some of us need to look back to where we once were. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed, right? Some of us have forgotten our first loves. We were sold out for Jesus and now we're sold out to our political agendas. We went from being on fire for the Lord to setting fire to relationships with people that live differently than us. Friends, I think it's really easy for us to swap things for our identity that should be Jesus. And I think the encouragement here of this picture from Acts 2 is that we 
need to go first to the Lord for unity and remember that that's who, that's who he is, that's what he's offering, and that's what he wants most for us, is that unity with him. Now, how do we do this with other people? Because it's, I, I think it's a little bit easier to deal with unity with God in our own life. It's just me and it's the Lord. But how do we deal with unity with other people? Because that's where rubber meets the road, right? That's where the most conflict is in our workplaces, in our families, with our friends, with our spouses. Unity, I believe, comes through our faithful response to preach the gospel. And here's what I mean by that. Unity comes through us responding to who God is in a way that matches Jesus with those around us. And when I say unity comes through a faithful response to preach the gospel, that means that our lives preach who Jesus is. You don't need to be on stage. You don't need to wear the Britney Spears mic. You need to live it out with those around you. Embody it. Because that's what we see in this picture here in Acts 2. Peter is in the midst of this dissension and belief. Holy Spirit does this incredible stuff. And then we look at verse 13. Can we go to that passage there? I'll read it for a sec. Verse 13 says, Some, however, made fun of them and said they had too much wine. Right? Have you ever done something incredible in your life and somebody was like, eh, but you had help with that. Or like, they're, like they were knocking them down at the knees or cutting them off at the knees and saying, oh, that's not a real thing. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. I love that that's in there. It's like, well, is it bottomless mimosa Sunday? I don't know. But it's only nine in the morning. And then he goes on. I won't read the whole thing. He goes on to share with the people present, hey, here's who our God is and here's what he's doing. Here's why we believe what we believe. And we would love to invite you to experience the freedom and the goodness of God. That's Peter's response to somebody just saying, hey, what you're doing, we don't believe in. And what that leads to at the end of that passage, it says, and that led to 3,000 people receiving Christ that day. 3,000 were added to their numbers. Let's be honest with ourselves. When was the last time you had a, uh, a division with somebody that led to them knowing Christ as their savior? I haven't had, I don't think I can think of one where I got a fight with somebody and that led to them knowing God more. It usually led with them thinking less of Christians, thinking less of who God is. If somebody calls you out and says, that great thing you did, nah, that's whack. Man, does that lead to anything good? Because if God is love, truth, goodness, unity, care, and justice, do our confrontations, conversations, and relationships lead to that? Usually not, because here's what we want. We want to win, right? We want to be the ones that are correct. We want to destroy their argument. Go on YouTube for two seconds. Christian theologian destroys atheist, right? Like that's what these clickbait titles are because so many of us just want to win. We want to be right. We want to be validated. There's a psychologist that's speaking about human division. And she says this, the impulse for division isn't just about human aggression or need for conflict. The most important factor is human beings need for identity. Quite simply, we love to belong to groups because it gives us a sense of identity. We love to peg our hats to groups because it reinforces our sense of self. Now check this. However, an important part of group identity is opposition to other groups. What this means is, is that we as humans pride ourselves up by putting others down. That's the classic schoolyard bully, right? A kid getting picked on, it's like, well, why do you make fun of the other kid? Well, because it makes you feel better. That we do that the same as adults. Unfortunately, we as Christians have told the world a lot about what God is apparently anti, and we haven't done a good job telling the world what God is pro. What if instead of the world saying, oh, the church doesn't allow this, God hates this, all that different stuff, what if the world knew by our preaching of it and our talking about it that God is on the side of the oppressed? So the Bible says, what about if the world knew that God cares about orphans and widows or that God wishes that none should perish or that God desires to carry their burdens or that God wants to provide for them? And unity is about loving people that have differing views than you. Uh, this is a quote from Preston Sprinkle. He writes a really good book called People to be Loved. And he says, it wasn't Jesus's stance on extortion that led to Zacchaeus's repentance. It was Zacchaeus' encounter with the otherworldly love of Christ, love without footnotes, 
that pushed repentance out the other side. And Jesus never had to tell Zacchaeus where he stood on the issue of tax collecting. Friends, what if we as Christians, rather than having to be standing on this and telling everyone what we think and what political party we're on and all this different stuff, what if rather than that, we modeled Christ-likeness? What if rather than dividing, we listened, we sought to understand, we cast off that which defines us that isn't Christ? I do want to say for a second that I want to affirm you guys as Overflow Church for a moment. I have not been at Overflow Church very long. I moved to St. Joe uh, in December of 2022. My wife, Katie, and I uh, landed here in February of 2023. We had not experienced a church as beautifully diverse as Overflow is. As much as I'm saying today, even to myself, of all the things that we need to work on, I want to say that this is a beautiful thing here at Overflow, and it is unique. Martin Luther King, uh, in an interview, he said, I think this is one of the tragedies of our nation. One of the most shameful tragedies is that 11 a.m. on Sunday morning is one of the most segregated hours, if not the most segregated hour in Christian America. And praise God, that's not true here. Amen? I just want to affirm you for that. Yeah, we can clap it up. That's all God, baby. That's all him. That's beautiful. That's holy. That's church. Like, that's what's up. And that's such a good thing because I, be- I love that I can invite someone to church And no matter the degree of melanin in their skin, they're represented here. That's huge. And so I just want to affirm you for that because I think that's what God cares about. That's what heaven's going to be like, that we are a diverse, and it's young, and it's old, it's black, and it's white, and it's Asian, it's all these different races, all these different people, all this stuff. Man, that's what God cares about. And that is a step towards unity, is getting rid of the things that divide us. And so I just want to affirm you for that and say thank you for being that example to the world around us. Because the third point here is that unity needs to be our example. Unity needs to be our example. The believers described here are this, uh, this beautiful picture. I don't know about you guys, um, but sometimes I'm on Instagram, uh, and I see a recipe, and I just go, oh, that looks so good. I want that so bad. And it's always like BuzzFeed or Tasty or one of these people. And it's like full Paula Deen, 12 sticks of butter. Like it's definitely not the healthy thing that I want, but it's the thing that just sounds so good. And I look at it and I go, oh, I want that. That would be so good. And then I go to Meyer and I buy the ingredients and it turns out terrible. Um, but This passage, when I read this passage that we're about to look at, I look at it like a delicious recipe on Instagram, and I go, oh, I want that so bad. And I think as you guys read it, I hope that you have that desire as well. We're going to look at Acts 2, verse 42. It says this. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is talking about the people. We're in the same story. This is describing them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers daily those who were being saved." I am a 100% extrovert. I've done the tests. I've done it all. Like, maybe 99 because sometimes I have to sleep. But I love being with people. And I read this passage and I'm like, give me that. I want to break bread with people daily. Let's hang out. Let's be together. Let's be in community. And I know that there's introverts in this room that are like, every day? Uh, And I know there's germaphobes in this room who are like, who's breaking the bread? They sanitize? I don't know, right? You might be reading this passage, and that may not sound as good to you as it, did, as it does to me. But I see this picture here of these believers, and they have an example of unity that is so beautiful and so incredible. I don't know about you, but I want that. And what's so cool about that, that last verse says, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Not only were they together, but their togetherness brought about effect on their community. Friends, this is not just a holy huddle here. We don't come to church just to hang out together, high five each other for showing up and then going about our lives, doing whatever we want. The idea of church, the reason why we meet is to praise God, to be together, to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflict and then go out and have an effect on our world. 
And that's what is seen here is that they did that. They were together, they were breaking bread and people wouldn't have got, been getting saved, wouldn't have been added to their numbers if they weren't telling anybody. They were living it out. I don't know about you guys, but I love a story of when unlikely people have to work together. Anybody here fans of The Office? Any Office fans? Sweet. You can admit it. It's fine. You don't have to be ashamed. Some of you guys are like, he's talking about a lot of secular stuff. This is church. I can't say Ted Lasso. I can't talk about the, like, I got to put on my church face here. Uh, we can talk about it. It's fine. Uh, but like Jim and Dwight, right? Mortal enemies. But then they come together to throw Kelly a birthday party. And there's a sign on the wall that says, it is your birthday. So that way she knows it is her birthday, right? It's a beautiful thing. It's incredible. And they even have balloons that match the carpet. Who doesn't want that, Right? I love when you see things working together well. Um, I have been married. It'll be seven years this summer. And there's times in marriage or even in a friendship or a relationship or you're dating or just maybe a coworker where you feel like, hey, we're walking hand in hand. We're working together. This is going well. And then something comes up and you fight about it. And it feels like even though you're in the same room, they're about a million miles away, right? Anybody ever been there? Not me. Katie and I are perfect. I'm, I'm, I made this up. I had to Google how to fight. Just kidding. Fully us. And then the tachometer, which is the thing on your car that's got the lower numbers, um, just kind of starts to go out of the red. And you kind of start to work back together. And you come together sheepishly, and you're like, hey, I'm really sorry. I should have said that. And you start to get together, and then you hug it out, and you forgive each other and all that stuff. And it goes from being these two opposite teams to being on the same team. And you get to this point, and you're like, why were we even fighting? We're on the same team here. We're working together. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Let's get back to our common goal. You know, it's a lot like Derek Zoolander and Hansel working together to take down Mugatu and make sure that Derek doesn't kill the prime minister of Malaysia, right? Some of you guys are like, I love Zoolander. Some of you guys are like, I'm never coming back to this church. (laughs) But it's incredible because they, in this story, if you've ever watched Zoolander, he goes, man, I was whack. And he goes, no, man, I was whack. And then they hung it out and they hang out and it's incredible. Man, we're getting so focused sometimes on our division. And if we could just come back together, we would do something beautiful. That song that we sang, imagine what would happen with all the faith in the room. Imagine what would happen if all the Christians just started working together. Imagine what, because has anybody, has anybody ever asked you as a Christian, uh, hey, can you describe denominations to me? This is what it looks like for me when I try to describe denominations. It's this, right? It's like, oh, well, uh, these guys over here, and this, like it's this whole, Google like denominational map, and there's like, it's all this crazy stuff. It's always fun, sunny in Philadelphia. Any fans? Any fans? No worries. Okay, it's fine. Thank you. Appreciate it. This is what it's like, because we as Christians have been so, so good at dividing, that's like, our, that's like our main thing. That, we're so good at it. Like, almost like we practice for it, right? It's not a game. It's, we're talking about practice, right? 1 Corinthians 1.10 says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. And that's the call to us, is to be united. But what we do is divide, and it breaks God's heart. We divide with the world outside. We divide in, inside the walls of the church. We just divide, 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 and say, I'm not talking to that person anymore. I'm not reconciling that person. And we divide over things that we in the church would call secondary issues. So primary things, Jesus, God, the Trinity, Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection, the inerrancy of scripture, all these different things. And then we have secondary issues. And these are the things we almost always divide on chairs or pews, the color of the carpet, style of worship, how long somebody's skirt should be, should you drink alcohol? And it's all the things that you're like, "Ah, is it that important? Like, do we need to divide over that, right? It's all the stuff that doesn't super matter. We've let the main thing no longer be the main thing. And in that division, we slander, we speak ill of those who act differently, and we don't even always have the receipts. We just say it. When we divide and cast judgment, we're a bad example of what God is like. We as the church will not reach the world around us if we don't even model unity ourselves. Man, how can we love those outside the walls of the church if we can't even love those inside the walls of the church? So what do we do? We look for reconciliation with those we've divided with. We shift our identity from anything other than Christian we shift it back to, I'm on team Jesus, 
and the other teams, they're not, they're not my team anymore. You might even believe, you might have some political agenda that you fully believe wholeheartedly, but are you going to let that define you more than Jesus? It's whack. It's so whack. John 13, 35 says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Guys, we got to start actually loving one another. And I'm saying this just as much for myself. I got to start loving people more than I do. People that look differently than me, people that believe differently than me. Because here's what I know is that everyone is made in the image of God. And in God's eyes, you don't have to believe to belong to his love. He loves you regardless. He loves you regardless. So why are we not loving people regardless? Man, we got to start doing that if we want to be an example to the world. Joel, you can come on up, man. Maybe you're here today and you resonate with the church's lack of unity. Maybe you're here today and you're like, man, church has sucked for me. Church has been really harmful in my life. Maybe you're here today and you feel the effects of disunity down to the core because of unchristlike behavior. Maybe you didn't agree with everyone around you and because of that, you were labeled as somebody who was causing trouble. Maybe you were asking questions and people said, don't ask those questions. We don't ask those questions. We just believe and we keep our head down, right? Man, I just want to say from friend to friend, I am so sorry that that happened to you because the whole goal of unity is that there is open space, that everyone is welcome, that you can look different, believe different, all those different things, and you are loved. And that we want to reconcile with you, we want to come together, and we want to bring you in to the fold of God, that you can experience his love and his grace and his freedom to the full, because the cross offers more unity. That is who our God is. For those of us here at Overflow that we call this church our home, we are all in on what God is doing here Would this be true of us? Would division be our enemy, not our fellow image bearers? Would no person be our enemy, but would division from those around us be our enemy? Would rifts or splits between believers grieve our hearts just like it does the Holy Spirit's? And would we be, would we live out unity with God, with one another and those outside these walls? Because I really, really believe that there is, that there is a God that loves every single person so much that he gave his life for them, that they may know life and life to the full. And if we believe that as well, then we can offer that to those around us by the way that we live, by the example that we share, and by the love that we pour out to everyone and anyone. I can't wait to see what God's going to do with that. Let's start doing that. Let me pray. Jesus, you gave us such a good example. God, you love tax collectors and prostitutes and broken people and people that were of different races that, that were divided. And God, you gave us this example of unity that all were welcome. God, would we as Christians live like all are welcome? God, would we quit casting dispersion? God, would we quit saying that person's less than? God, would we quit saying that denomination's bad and ours is good and making these teams and all that stuff? God, would we just be on team Jesus and see what you do with that? God, I thank you for today. I thank you for everybody in this room. And I thank you that you speak. Lord, would we listen? In Jesus' name, amen.